as we talk about a comprehensive strategy, we know that it has to be based on science. We know that any interventions that are effective need to be based on the research that we do. DC has been involved in some really groundbreaking research, and that research needs to be used to, have to guide the funding, to guide the um, services, and to guide the interventions. We now have Mr. Joseph Hall to come and up and talk to us about the importance of research being part of our strategy. Yes, yes, yes. I read that the CDC has asked this question, what is the number one health issue in your community? DC said HIV. It's number seven for the rest of the country. Number one here. All right. Let me ask you something. Dream with me for a bit. If you knew that in 10 years there could be a cure for HIV, we got 14,000 people in this city living with HIV. 40 million people across the globe living with HIV. If you knew that there could be a cure in 10 years, what would you say? You'd say, hell yeah, I can't wait for that. But yes. what if you found out that cure would work for you? It worked for, say, white men, say, it worked for Latino women, but it didn't work for black women. It didn't work for black men. That seems odd. How could that happen? Well, it happens all the time. I'll tell you about hepatitis C, another disease that's killing our people. Well, they did clinical trials on the hepatitis C many, many years ago, and the drugs were very, very successful, but they only really work on white men. Now, how did that happen? There were no black people enrolled in those trials. We've got major institutions in this city doing HIV research. At a meeting that we were at last week, one of the researchers said they're having a hard time enrolling people in their research. This, a part, this is part of the research trying to find a cure for HIV, yet we can't get anybody in it. How can that happen? We've got 14,000 people in this city, you know, living with HIV, but we can't get them into the clinical trials. You know, we don't have the kind of leadership from our government that says that we have a research agenda that's all about cure. We have a government that says we have a research agenda about preventing HIV, maybe, we have, a, we have an agenda about trying to figure out how to get vaccine, but nobody is really talking about how to cure HIV. And we've got 40 million people living with it, 14 million, 14,000 people in D.C. Don't you think those people want a cure? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They want a cure. We've got many, many um, universities, we've got several research hospitals, they're all doing research, all doing HIV research, but they're playing to their strengths, meaning they're doing research based upon the faculty and the researchers they have there already. What we need them to do is not play to their strength, but play to our need. We need to have research happening in this city that is looking for a cure for HIV. And we need to figure out a way to get our people to enroll in those trials. Part of that problem has to do with the fact that we've got this Tuskegee syphilis trial Woo! hangover. Well, you know something? That ended 10 years before the HIV epidemic began. And people are dying today because of that. We need to change that mindset. And where does it happen? It happens in school. We need to teach science better, to do a better job of teaching science to our young people. People are talking about sex education. That's great. But science education is sex education. We need to be a, do a better job of teaching our children so when they grow up, they respect science. When someone asks them if they want to roll in a clinical trial that might save their family member or something like that, they don't say, oh, no, I won't do that. They will say, yes, I want to be part of that. And we need our leaders, our elected leaders, who know how to fundraise, who know how to get elected. We need them to meet with the community, meet with these research institutions that say, we want a research agenda that concludes looking for a cure for HIV. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. We can't end AIDS without a cure. We can't end AIDS without a cure. We can't based on research, one that we know 
whole works, and that must be integrated into any work that we do is providing services from a harm reduction harm reduction perspective. So right now we have George Kerr coming up to talk to us about the importance of making sure that harm reduction remains part of the strategies that we use in ending the epidemic here in D.C. Mr. Kerr. Last year I stood at Union Station and asked the question, we know how to end HIV AIDS in the District of Columbia. The question is, when will we end AIDS? Harm reduction, condom distribution. We have amazing condom distribution with our ASOs here in the District of Columbia. So I have to applaud the government for doing that. I agree that we still need to get them into schools to educate our students about them. Once again, Hep C is another area. We need the research. We also need treatment. We need more funding. Getting people out there so they know they have the hepatitis C. Housing. Housing is prevention. We need to get the waiting list gone. We need housing for people living with HIV AIDS in the District of Columbia. Re-entry discrimination. Currently, there is the Returning Citizens Anti-Discrimination Act of 2012, which will help stop the discrimination of people coming out of the prison system. I was just told just a couple of minutes ago there's 60,000 people that have been incarcerated in the District of Columbia and are discriminated. We need to sign on to this petition and have City Council move this legislation forward. For more information, look at the uh, uh, Washington Post article that was uh, done today. The question once again, how are we going to end the district, the uh, HIV? This is real emotional for me because I am HIV positive and I have been since 1995 and 30 years of fighting this epidemic. We need to end this epidemic at the District of Columbia, in the United States and in the world. PETFAR just announced last Thursday that they have a blueprint. Why the hell does it the District of Columbia? Community. Francisco. I am the game for the day. <laughs> Let everyone else speak. Um, I also wear different hats. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, a few months ago, we had the International AIDS Conference here. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, were there. Uh, if not in attendance at the conference because it was expensive. Uh, many activities that you guys organized. Um, and the success of that conference really was based on how we, what does DC do after July 27th, when everyone left, when all the receptions were done, all the drinks were had. Uh, and so now we're here, right? We're at a turning point of what is DC going to be doing? Uh, I actually work for a national organization. I don't work locally, but I live here, right? So I have I have an interest here in my community, particularly as, as a gay man, as a Latino gay man. We often talk about homophobia and stigma only for Latino communities, right? Uh, because machismo is only in Latino communities, not anywhere else. Uh, but we know that's not true. 
Uh, and so we need to make sure that you could have as many HIV tests as you want. You could share as many condoms as you want. But if you're not affirming that person as a person, a whole person, as a sexual being, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. And we're not going to end the epidemic. And so in working, we need to make sure we galvanize the leaders who started this process, right? The LGBT community, the gay organizations, uh, making sure that they're, getting, they're in this fight with us. It's not about one of us, it's not about one organization, it's a collective. And so I also work uh, on my non-paid non job as a Latino network, uh, that's a national Latino AIDS action network, where we just recently released the Latino agenda that clearly says, you know, the same sex issues, oftentimes Latinos are, are, are being uh, painted as not affirming those. But a study just came out that Latinos are actually more supportive than the general public of same-sex marriage, uh, of ending hate or, or supporting issue, uh, hate crime uh, bills, as well as supporting uh, adoption, gay, do gay adoption. And so oftentimes communities of colors are painted where you're the reason why this didn't pass in this particular state. And so we need to collectively come together. We need to make sure HRC, the National LGBT Coalition, and other organizations are really at the table. There's a conference coming up, Creating Change, I believe in January, where uh, for the first time in a, in a very long time, there's gonna be an HIV summit. Well, again, the goal is to get LGBT leaders who may not be focusing on uh, HIV, to get them there uh, at the table with us to make sure that we're collectively singing the song. Because louder, as we have been marching with our, our, our chants, the louder we are more powerful, and the louder we are, the higher they can hear us in that building and any other building that we want to be uh, preaching. So, uh, again, the LGBT community has started us Right? They started the LGBT movement, they started the HIV movement. We need them back at the fold to really make sure that we address the epidemic as a full person. Not just a prevention person, not just a healthcare access person, but a full person as an LGBT. And then obviously we need our straight allies. Because we, we need to make sure every, you know, everyone is at the table. So, thank you. We've talked about the research that needs to be part of the uh, uh, part of the ending of the <laughs> epidemic, and we need to make sure that part of that research includes research for a cure. There's another real major intervention that's expensive, and yeah, we know it's expensive, but if we don't address it, none of these other interventions are going to be effective. You can't cure. AIDS. You can't end AIDS when people are homeless on the streets. So right now we have Amber Harding coming up to talk to us about the importance of housing being part of this strategy to end the epidemic. Amber. Thank you everyone. I hope you can hear me because I have a cold. So I don't want to shout too much. So I'm an attorney at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless and I think a lot of people don't really know what affordable housing has to do with health issues, or what affordable housing has to do with HIV AIDS. So I want to tell you a couple stories about clients I've worked with so you can see how direct the connection is and how much affordable housing is a critical intervention for people with HIV AIDS. First, I want to tell you about a woman that I met when I was a brand new attorney, my first year at the legal clinic. Uh, we're going to call her Miss Johnson. And she lived out at the uh, family shelter. Does anyone remember DC Village? Yes. Okay, old hospital, broken down, terrible condition. Um, when she was there, she was there with two kids of hers. And uh, she got hospitalized three times in one month. She got pneumonia, she got really sick. And she came to us and she said, look, I'm HIV positive. My doctor said my T cell count is really scary right now. It's because I get every single thing that comes through this door, every cold that kid has, every pneumonia, every virus that comes through, I get sick. And I said, okay, we're gonna help you. We're gonna move you to uh, a better spot, apartment style shelter. Can't get you into housing right now because there isn't any, but maybe I can get you into better shelter. So I made the request. It took a couple months. She died. She died in an old hospital on 
right next to the wastewater treatment plant because there was no housing for her and she couldn't handle living in a place with that many other people around. So I tell you about another man we call him Mr. Harrison that we're working with right now. He also, when we met him, was HIV positive. He had learned he was positive three years earlier and um, he has a doctor. He has made access to medication, um, but he's homeless. He stayed at one of the big, again, communal shelters, like they all are for men, where a hundred men sleep on cots in one room, and he got pneumonia and was hospitalized. He decided he would rather risk things living on the street than having to stay in a shelter with that many other people around. But the problem is, when you live on the street, you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you can't cook your own food, you can't eat healthy. And then he had to stop taking his medicine because he had side effects from his medicine that made it that he couldn't control his bowels and he didn't have access to bathrooms living on the street. He just couldn't do it. He now is no longer HIV positive. He has full-blown AIDS. He had lost 30 pounds in one month, got hospitalized, and is worried constantly that he's going to die on the street. He's been on every housing list that there is. He's been waiting the whole time, three years, for housing. There are over, over a thousand people on the waiting list for the federal, um, federally funded program that's for people with HIV AIDS. There are over 67,000 people on the waiting list down at 1133 North Capitol, the Housing Authority for Affordable Housing. If this city could do one thing, it could ensure that people like Mr. Harrison didn't have to die on the street, that Ms. Johnson didn't have to die in that old hospital. We could so easily end homelessness for people who are HIV AIDS. People who have HIV AIDS have a right to housing. It is inhumane. We call ourselves a human rights city. We are not a human rights city when we let people die on the street. Woo!